representation is as follows. We represent roughly 56,000 kids, the second largest school board in BC. How seriously underfunded is our school system, particularly the Vancouver School Board? Our official brief to the government says that the VSB, we, we're telling them straight out, we're flatly accusing them of seriously underfunding our system. The estimate is we have a shortfall of, now listen to this carefully, 310 million, that's 52.5%. That's absolutely outrageous for a system such as ours. Worse still, in special education, special, we have a shortfall of $22 million. That means special ed teachers, ESL teachers, special needs teachers, specialized teachers at the high school level, the list goes on and on. This can continue, folks. Stand up for our teachers. Thank you. Yeah. Our next speakers are students at University Hill Secondary. Oh. Lane Young and Alicia Smith are both in grade 12. And um, I just like to say, first of all, our teachers mean everything to us. We love them so much, and they do everything for us. For theater, we're both in theater company, and our our theater teachers oh my God, so they stay ten o'clock at night. They make they ask the janitors order pizza, order pizza. They do. They come early. They stay late. They stay over lunch. Um, when our science teacher, she will stay with us. She says. Flat out, you stay with me over lunch and I will help you in anything you need and she will help us get a better mark and help us do everything. Yeah, and with the underfunding and stuff, my chemistry 12 class doesn't have enough textbooks for the whole class. We were supposed to have a test coming up and some people had no textbook to study from and it's just ridiculous. Yeah, we don't have a lot of our novels, our novels that everyone is supposed to be able to read, we're supposed to be academic students, we don't even have enough of them and they're torn apart, pages are missing. There's like written in them. I mean, we, we can't even get new ones. And our teachers are like, well, and sometimes they'll even dip in their own pockets and get us things that we need. And a lot of the times teachers will say things like, we don't have pencils. We, we need you to bring them, guys. We don't, we can't do that for you. I'm sorry. But they'll bring their own out, out of their pencil case and they'll give it to us. And they'll be like, yeah, don't worry about it. I, whatever. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, pretty much. We're our teachers. We stand behind them 110%. We come to the rallies and we come to the picket lines. We bring cupcakes, which yeah. they're telling yeah. us. And a bunch of us are doing it. So to say, that, to say that students are suffering, yeah, we're suffering. We're suffering in our classes. And we're suffering now because our, stu our teachers are doing, <laughs> we're suffering. <laughs> we're suffering because of the class sizes and the undercut funding. Yeah. <laughs> we don't have any kindergarten kids here to talk. We've got a kindergarten <laughs> teacher, My brother uh, Lana Hill, who teaches at uh, Gerald Gordon Elementary. <laughs> Hello. Um, first of all, I'm, I'm, first of all, I'm here as a, a grad of the education program at UBC, which is excellent. Um, in 2002, when the government uh, stripped our contracts, we were like the walking wounded, those of us who are still walking. And we put our heads together, those of us who have taught in other parts of the world, and came to a very quick realization that the teacher training in Canada is second to none. We felt that we were really well trained. We've been out in the world, we've seen other school systems. There isn't a better system that we had shared anywhere else in the world. Canada, Vancouver, British Columbia has an excellent education system. What is it that they're trying to fix? But more importantly, what I wanted to share with you is a message, we had dialogue with our students at school on the Thursday before we walked on Friday. And one of our grade six teachers uh, said, he was talking to his class about, well, what does uh, essential services actually mean? They were having that dialogue. And one of the students said, well, if the government's saying that education's an essential service, why do they keep cutting the funding? <laughs> <laughs> And then 
with my own uh, kindergarten class, sometimes when you have to um, explain things in their simplest terms, the kids were saying, what's a strike? Why aren't you coming to school? So we sat down and we had one of our cozy class meetings and I said to the kids, when you come to this school, do you feel safe? Oh yeah, they said, we feel safe. Great. And when you come to this school, do you feel happy? Yeah, we're happy. And I said, do you feel smart? Yeah, we're smart. And I said, well, the teachers want that to be fair for all the kids in all the schools. We want everybody to feel safe, everyone to be happy, and everyone to be as smart as they can be. And then, and then I realized that as a teacher, I don't feel safe. I don't feel safe from the history of what's been happening in this province. And I've been teaching since 1967. My 20-year-old uh, son wants to be a teacher, and I, I want it to be a good profession for him. My six-month-old granddaughter will be coming into the system. We are all working for our future, and that's why I repeat the question. Canada's education system ranks third in the world, globally. The states ranks 30th, if you want to make comparisons. We know that we have a good system. We just need to recognize that and support it. So thank you, everybody. Yeah. Once again, I want to say thanks to everybody who's come out and stood in the rain and listened to this. I hope, uh, I hope this gives sustenance to the folks that need it. Energy, it does to me. And more importantly, I hope it does for the teachers on the line. My name is Wayne Ross. I'm a professor in the Department of Curriculum Studies. I've been here at UBC for a couple of years. I'm an old social studies teacher. Uh, I have been involved in uh, social studies education for a long time. So when, uh, when Gordon Campbell starts giving lessons on citizenship, it gets my attention. <laughs> if you're a teacher, or if you follow anything about uh, education policy these days, you know that the big buzzword is accountability. You can't be a teacher and not think about issues of accountability. And I want to talk in kind of an indirect way, maybe, about what accountability, the issue of accountability, and with the situation that we're faced with today, with Bill 12, with Gordon Campbell and the liberals, people of that ilk. I've been involved in teacher education for a long time, and I've seen a lot of aspiring teachers, many, many, teachers come into teacher ed programs and they're motivated because they, they're really excited about and have a passion for working with kids, working with youth. Many secondary teachers come in passionate about their subject matter and working with kids. And I think that's really important. Those are necessary conditions to be an effective teacher, to be a good teacher. But to really be an effective teacher, you have to think beyond those passions of working with kids and your passion for your subject matter. I think an important element of that is understanding your role within the school. Your role as a worker within schools. That's not to deny that there are other parts of your identity that are important. There are disabled workers, there are Filipino workers, there are Punjabi workers, there are gay workers, straight workers, white workers. But I think in this case, what we're looking at with schools in BC is the importance of understanding as a teacher your role as a worker. And then putting a question to yourself that's not only about your personal politics, but it's also about your pedagogical practice. And that is, in whose interests am I working? Another way to put that is, who am I really accountable to? Am I really accountable to a government that would dictate what I'm supposed to teach in the classroom to a government that would strip, that would ignore international labor laws, that would strip away bargaining rights from all public sector workers, is that who you're accountable to? No! Many teachers don't think about that when you're first starting out, but I, you know, all you have to do is experience workplace conditions for a little while and you start really feeling like a worker. Maybe you have more in common with the baristas down at the Starbucks than you wanted to think. Now, one thing that's really clear is that the mainstream media, Can West, the Globe and Mail, the Liberals, the government, they understand in whose interest they work. 
That's clear. And they've made decisions in that way. And it's important for us to understand as teachers what's in our best interest and who we're accountable to. Now, uh, I think we can name those interests behind Gordon Campbell pretty clearly. I call it capital. You might call it something else. But I think the issue that we face today is really about shared interests. And when we start to ask questions about who are we looking to, we, we should be thinking about the interests of our students. That's the message of this strike. Looking at teaching and learning conditions for students in schools in BC. Looking at solidarity with other labor, with, with other workers, with labor, other, uh, it, within the labor movement. The blind kind of obedience of law discourse, the discourse of obedience that's coming from the BC Council, uh, uh, the BC Business Council, the, the BC Chamber of Commerce, Gordon Campbell, Mike the Young, that illustrates who they're that illustrates who they're working for, what their interests are. And I think for us, the important thing to do is not to allow working for justice and teaching for justice to be sidelined by some discourse of obedience that would divert our attention away from the main agenda of the day, which is to educate students in a free and fair way, so that they understand their world, so that they have an opportunity to understand their world and to make meaning of their world, but also to act on their world. And if we teach from within a discourse of obedience, where the number one rule is to obey the law, we cannot teach for justice. And I think that's a key thing for all of us to remember. It's a key thing for beginning teachers to remember. The lessons from this strike, in terms of resisting the discourse of obedience, can be the starting point for a, a pedagogy that's liberating not just for teachers as workers, but for the students in our classrooms. This is, a, this is the message that I hope after this is settled, when, we go, when teachers go back into the classroom, we don't go back just having bargained a higher wage, just having bargained classroom size, those things are important. But that we take back the lesson that we, of who we really share our interests with, and that we focus on teaching for justice, and, and then that, in my mind, is really what an effective teacher is about. Thank, thanks for coming. I want to thank I want to thank, uh, as I introduce Steve Petrina, who's a professor in the Department of Curriculum Studies, for getting our speaker system together for us today. Steve and a number of his students. We won't ask where all the equipment came from. <laughs> and Steve's got a few things to say for to us in closing. Great. Hi, everyone. For the record, I didn't do anything. I just showed up, said a few words, and then left. When I took my first teaching job in 1984, we went out on strike. I didn't know what was going to happen. We, we went out on strike. And guess, who's, guess whose picture was on the front page of the local newspaper? Holding up a big old sign said, Governments roll the dice, students and teachers pay the price. And um, ever since that, that front page episode, I've been ticked off, and I'm still t ticked off about that. But I'm here to say that I support teachers, I support union activism, I support labor, I support solidarity, I support collective action. It's the only message we can send to this government. It's symbolic, it's real, it's powerful, okay? I teach in the Department of Curriculum Studies here, and it's really good to see the teachers, the student teachers out here. It's fantastic to see them out here in the rain. It's great to see our CUPE members out here. It's great to see our BCTF members, and it's great to see everyone out here in the rain at lunchtime to support the BCTF and teachers throughout the province. Thank you for coming, okay? Definitely. All right, it's great, great to see some of the young, young kids out here too. There we go. I 
I got a few messages. One message is to our student teachers who are out here. I think it's crucial, it's really crucial that you adopt a strong pro-union position at this point in history, okay? Your future depends on it. Our future depends on it. Since 2001, this Liberal government cut 2,600 teachers from the system. This means when you, that when you leave UBC, your chances of finding a full-time teaching job is getting slimmer and slimmer, okay? But there are other reasons why, you need, why our new teachers need to support our unions. You're in positions to teach the youth of Canada and influence their beliefs in the power of unions and in the power of labor activism. Unions have to appeal to youth for their future. The future of youth is the future of unions, okay? And remember, when the Canadian Labor Congress convened here in Vancouver in 1996, they adopted a primary resolution calling for youth to become a central outreach and organizing activity for all union affiliates. We know the situation of youth in Canada. High unemployment, over 25% for the young people in Canada. Most of them have no chance of becoming a union member, okay? And you know the wages, and you know what goes along with casual labor and part-time labor, and you know the difficulties that go along with unemployment. So all the new teachers here, you have a real chance to make a difference in these young people's lives by talking to them about these things, by teaching things like peace, by teaching things like activism, okay? Union density in, union, well, union density in Canada has been declining. We know that. That's not a good thing. And you know union density is basically the percentage of employed people who are in a union, who have the right to be in a union and who are the, uh, have the privilege to be in a union. It's below 30% right now, okay? It's dipped. It's dipped to an all-time low. There's union busting activity going on across Canada, across North America, and in many ways on a global scale. So it's really, really important that you take a stand at this point in history. Okay? It's really important. The highest union density rates are in education. Right? Our teachers. We're 70% of all teachers are union members. And you see what the power is there in terms of union activism. You see what teachers can do. And you see what teachers can do in the classroom. We heard from some of our students. And you see what teachers can do outside of the classroom too. And I'm really proud of the teachers here in BC. And I'm really proud to be a teacher right now. I'll tell you. Really, really proud. So we've got to act on this right that we have to be a union member. We've got to act on this privilege, okay? Not just for ourselves, right? For, for the future, for the young people, for everyone in Canada at this point in time. So for all of you who are out there, out there walking the picket line, out there getting ready to teach, out there wanting to teach, out there supporting teachers, out there getting ready for another for another negotiation, for another round of bargaining with this government. Stand strong. We have a right to free bargaining. We have a right in this province to fair bargaining. We have a right to bargain working conditions. Okay? We have that right. And let's exercise that right. Okay? A lot of, a lot of contracts are coming up within this next year. And this is just the start of it. So I'm really, really, really proud of the teachers for taking a stand and for putting things into perspective within this province. Okay? You're lucky you I'm really proud. So we're just going to end here. First, I want to say thank you. Thank you very much for coming out and all of those who helped to put this together all the support that you've been showing. I want to say keep it up. And remember, teachers divided can never be defeated. Teachers united can never be defeated. <laughs> teachers united can never be defeated. Teachers united can never be defeated. Unions united can never be defeated. Unions united can never be defeated. Teachers united can never be defeated. Unions united 
can never be defeated. Teachers united can never be defeated. Unions united can never be defeated. Teachers united can never be defeated. Unions united can never be defeated. Remember that. I got one last message here. The UBC and the FS SFU student teachers supporting public education are rallying on fri Friday, October 21st from 3 to 6. 3 to 6. That's 3 o'clock to 6 o'clock. <laughs> Granville and Broadway. Okay, be there. Granville and Broadway, Friday, October